Welcome, everyone. Just getting everybody in the room. So many folks, this is very exciting. All right, I think there is a critical mass of folks in the Zoom room with us. Um, welcome, everyone. We're so excited to see you. Uh, my name is Allison Korn. I'm clinical professor and director of the Health Justice Clinic at Duke Law School. Um, and it's uh, really a great pleasure to welcome you to the first session of our Teaching Justice webinar series for the 2023-2024 school year. This is our sixth year of doing this series, and uh, we're just overjoyed that um, it has continued and continues to kind of nourish us um, and that we've had the opportunity to learn um, from so many of you and learn alongside so many of you. So, so thank you so much for, for keeping us going. Um, today, uh, we are um, launching and so excited to welcome our guests uh, who will be presenting Building on Teaching Critical Legal Research uh, with Law Librarians. Uh, this is a session that builds on um, a session presented last year. Uh, and so we're rejoined by Priya Baskaran and Nicholas Mininelli, um, who uh, have, have joined some, some of their colleagues uh, from West Virginia University School of Law, Nick Stump, uh, as well as uh, Tia Ward from UVA School of Law. Um, they're going to be building on that last year's session because, as we often learn in teaching justice, um, rarely can all uh, ground be covered in a single session. So we want to think about this as an evolution and also continue to build those bridges across disciplines and across our clinical and law library communities. So so welcome um, to, to both of you and um, and to uh, your your extended colleagues. We're so excited to learn from you today. Layla? Yeah, great to see everyone. Um, I'm Layla Halaf. Uh, I am a member and uh, co-chair of CLIA's Best Practices and Pedagogy Committee. And today's talk uh, is part of the Teaching Justice webinar, as Allison was saying, which is a project of CLIA's Best Practices Committee. And we have this amazing history now of years of having innovative faculty talking about new approaches to teaching justice in the classroom, thinking about how to draw on the wisdom of current social movements, and also think about <clears throat> intersections um, of criminal justice, immigration policy, racial justice, uh, and all sorts of critical topics um, and, and different critical lenses. I wanna make a note uh, put a teaser out there that on November 8th, we're going to have Lee Goodmark from Maryland presenting Teaching Abolition Feminism through work with criminalized survivors. Um, so put that on your calendar. We have a full calendar that we're really excited about um, in the spring as well. So please um, stay tuned to the CLIA website. Uh, look uh, at those listservs and you'll uh, see kind of ongoing information about how to register. If you go to the website for sure, we'll also have that information. Um, and we do want to let you know, you've probably already seen that this session is being recorded um, and it, like all of our past sessions, will be made available um, on the CLIA website. Um, we'll circulate that information through the list serves, but of course, as Layla said, stay tuned to um, the CLIA website as well for updates as well as registration for future sessions. Uh, we encourage, as always, interaction using the chat function. Um, we have a full presentation today from all of our amazing presenters. But nonetheless, if you have a burning question, um, please put it in the chat and Layla and I um, will do our best to, to send those to our presenters. Um, we'll try and make time at the end as well for Q&A uh, across the wider group. Um, we do ask everyone to please mute their microphones if they haven't already, but um, encourage you if you'd like to keep your video screens open. Um, and uh, with that, um, take it away presenters. Again, so grateful to have you with us today. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and provide a little bit of framing. My name is Priya Baskaran. Um, I teach in a transactional clinic here at American University. Uh, and I have had the benefit of being able to incorporate uh, critical legal research and critical information literacy into my course. Um, and it has resulted in a far more rich and robust and effective representation for my clients. And so just to, again, like kind of provide us with a basic foundation as 
was we're exploring this topic. Critical information literacy and critical legal research are comprehensive theories, pedagogies, and practices that help students and lawyers understand the ways in which the legal research regimes are not neutral, but constructed and mostly constructed for for commercial purposes. And this very directly impacts our work in clinic because we represent indigent clients, excluded communities, we engage in movement lawyering and radical transformation, but our work is not always copacetic with these commercial purposes and constructs of the legal research re regime, right? And so one of the ways I like to think about this is um, is saying that we represent environmental justice frontline communities, and what we have access to are resources and tools designed for the in-house attorneys at Exxon, right? And so what these um, what these uh, theories and pedagogies and practices try to do is equip us to understand, you know what is not going to work for us and how do we then build a new strategy and understand how to navigate these things to actually effectively advocate and uh, if you will permit my pun, researching for justice, right? Um, so that is the hope of our panel today is to kind of talk about some of these topics, talk about some of the pedagogies and the practical applications, uh, and then talk about what's honestly coming down the pipe as things like um, you know, like AI is going to change the landscape of legal research. Uh, so I'm going to start by turning it over to Tia Ward, um, who is an expert in many things, including critical information literacy. Uh, so um, I'll go ahead and, and start there. Thank you, Priya, for the introduction. I am going to share my screen. Okay, I have started sharing my slides and I see a thumbs up from one of you. Teaching critical information literacy is my topic. I teach advanced legal research at the University of Virginia School of Law. And in my class, we don't just talk about research and evaluating information, we do it because students learn by doing. On the first day of class, I share the following quotation with students. Tell me and I forget, teach me and I may remember, involve me and I learn. It's a quotation derived from the teachings of the philosopher Shunza, and it is true. Involvement in learning includes in-class exercises and discussions. Involving the students in, in learning is part of teaching critical information literacy. Information literacy and critical information literacy are related. However, critical information literacy involves investigating the purpose behind the information. The librarian Eamon Tool has noted that generally people are information literate if they can use information to complete their work and do their civic duties. However, critical information literacy deals with being able to interact with and deal with the powerful systems that undergird how information is created and how information is distributed. Critical information literacy is an outgrowth of critical pedagogy. In his book, Pedagogy of the Opp Oppressed, Paulo Freire, who was an educator, rejects the banking concept of education in favor of problem posing education. In the banking practice of education, teachers tell students what they need to know and students memorize this information and repeat what the teacher has told them. As the educator James Elmborg has noted in problem posing education, there's a difference. There's a back and forth communication, a dialogue between the teachers and the students. Both the teachers and the students create the lesson. As the librarian Yasmin Soker Harker has noted, critical legal information literacy concerns who produces information and who profits from that information. Critical legal information literacy also concerns evaluating what information is missing and why and how the presentation of that information can affect how people perceive the information. Overall, critical information literacy recognizes that information is a social construct. 
In class this semester, we discussed how databases can be biased, how algorithms impact research results, and how information may be missing, and we had corresponding in-class exercises to reinforce these points. Such discussions and exercises are examples of critical legal information literacy and critical legal research. And I'm gonna paraphrase one of our co-speakers definitions of, of critical legal research, Nicholas Stump's definition. Critical legal research consists of creating and recreating legal concepts using alternative legal resources such as free government resources as well as pulling sources from a variety of fields as well as stopping researching and thinking. This semester, I taught a lesson called Thinking Outside the Box in Legal Research. And before the lesson, we had an assigned reading, Invisible Hands and the Triple Quadruple Helix Dilemma, Helping Students Free Their Minds by Yasmin Soker Harker. At the beginning of this class, I asked students to write answers to discussion prompts based on the reading, and then we discussed concepts in Harker's article. Some students stated that they had not thought of the invisible hands and how these invisible hands influence databases and in turn legal research. Some students wanted to know how to conduct searches that wouldn't be hampered by the algorithms and database, databases and search engines. I gave them three practices for conducting searches designed to get more information. First, search in a variety of databases. Second, think about how the legal issue that you are researching may be similar to another legal issue. See if the way of handling that other legal issue can be applied to the issue you are researching. Third, review the key numbers or topics and ask if the concepts can be described using different words. If so, what words? I asked students to think about an assertion of Richard Delgado and Jean Stefancic. A computer is good at showing you what is, it cannot show you what might be. In wrapping up our discussion, I mentioned how Delgado and Stefancic suggested turning off the computer and thinking about the research. This thinking or reflection without the aid of a machine is yet another way to think outside the box. For the corresponding in-class exercise, the students worked in their small groups on research exercises that I had developed before class. As part of their work, they were to compare what they found in subscription databases with what they found using the generative AI tool of their choice. They used free tools and were not required to purchase a subscription. In addition, they were to think about whether they were getting complete information and whether they trusted the information. At the end of each exercise, each group reported on what it had found by using presentation slides and sharing their computer screens. While some noted that information from the generative AI tool was helpful, others noted that generative AI would give false citations or hallucinations that generative AI would give details of situations with no citation, and these details couldn't be readily verified. And in some cases, they received no answer at all. One group reported receiving an error message in response to a prompt they had given the tool. Throughout this semester, I've shared the questions to ask for evaluating search result, results that Safiya Noble discusses in her book, Algorithms of Oppression. One question that Noble had proposed that we focused on for this exercise is, who is the intended audience for this information? One student said that for the generative AI tool used, lay people, in other words, lay people and not lawyers were the intended audience of the generative AI tool. The mention of lay people brings me to the issue of access to justice. There are many lay people who cannot afford to hire a lawyer. I share statistics with students such as 70 to 98% of state cases dealing with areas of civil law, such as family law, 
domestic violence, landlord tenant, and small claims issues involve at least one unrepresented litigant, according to Jessica Steinberg, who is a professor at George Washington University Law School. In federal district court, on average, 25% of cases filed are filed by unrepresented litigants, according to Andrew Hammond, a professor at Indiana University's Marsh School of Law. And this 25% represents people who are not incarcerated. According to its 22 report entitled The Justice Gap, the Legal Services Corporation estimates that 92% of low-income Americans do not get any or enough legal help for their civil legal problems that have a major impact on their lives. Courts, both at the federal and state levels, are aware of these problems, and many are trying to ameliorate the, these issues through various programs, for example, access to justice commissions. How do access to justice issues relate to legal research? Well, these issues relate in many ways to legal research. However, in class, I highlight three ways. First, people who cannot afford to hire a lawyer may not be able to purchase access to subscription databases. They are more likely to rely on open access or free legal information resources. Second, some nonprofits and some smaller organizations engaged in legal advocacy may not have access or may have limited access to subscription databases. Third, researchers who have access to subscription databases should consider using open access databases and sources as well. From a critical information literacy standpoint, it is important that law students know how to access information in a variety of formats and places and know how to evaluate that information so that they will be prepared for their future work. I focus on subscription databases as sources of information. However, I let students know and in-class exercises include resources from open access databases. For example, for municipal law, I present the open access database Municode as an option. For the lesson on searching dockets, I discuss public access to court electronic records, PACER, and the controversies surrounding making PACER truly free of charge. Part of critical pedagogy is centering students' voices. One way that I center students' voices is through a research assignment in which students choose their own legal research topic and then present what they have found to the class. Through this assignment, their research and their evaluation of that research takes center stage. There are preliminary assignments such as a research log or mind map if they choose before the final written assignment is due. It's rewarding to see students' evaluation of information and how they note whether they think a source is credible or whether a source is not credible and in what context they found the source. The written and oral components of this assignment incorporate the legal analysis and reasoning, legal research, problem solving, and written and oral communication in the legal context, which align with ABA standard 302B. Part of critical pedagogy is reflecting. Reflection, reflection is something that both students and educators should do. After every class, I take a few moments to think about what went well, what I would like to change, and what I may need to follow up on for the next class. I also give the students opportunities to reflect on what they're learning. I make space and time through surveys to ask students what they think of what they are learning or studying in class. In conclusion, critical information literacy, which is part of critical pedagogy, is about creating a dialogue and asking questions, some of which may not have readily apparent answers. However, the asking of these questions can cause us to think which is important when conducting legal research or any type of research. If you would like to access the in-class exercise that I mentioned, 
here is the link. And I'll put the link in the chat too. Thank you so much for that, Tia, and for sharing your exercises, which, um, considering this is your first uh, clinical faculty presentation, you're right on point. We love reflection and we love sharing exercises, so thank you for that. Um, so now I'm going to um, hand it over to Nick Stump, uh, and Nick and I are going to tag team some of this presentation a little bit because we have had the benefit of working together in the past. Um, so, um, Nick, if you can go ahead and, and start the presentation. Is your screen shared? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so Nick is going to talk to us about um, critical legal research in the critical environmental law application. I believe, Priya, you're going to kick things off with the uh, hypothetical? Yes. Sorry, for some reason, my screen is not um, maxed out. But yes, okay, so we are going to start with a hypo. Um, and so... Our hypo has to do with your client that is a, a community group. They have come to the clinic uh, looking for assistance and a little bit of background about this client. They are a, um, they're, uh, they are called Central Appalachian Advocates. They are a 501c3 tax exempt nonprofit organization and they have been engaged in kind of traditional uh, environmental law and law reform advocacy to meet their mission, which is two parts, to preserve a safe environment uh, and natural beauty in West Virginia, but also to protect the surrounding communities from kind of downstream negative impacts from the coal industry and other extractive industries. Um, and so they've been really trapped in this decades-long litigation loop where the best case scenario is that they successfully challenge or limit and limit, you know, uh, existing permits that allow the coal industry to discharge into headwaters and lakes and streams in the nearby area. And the best case scenario, again, is that they can just prevent this uh, these permits from being issued, but they're having more and more problems because new industries like natural gas um, and a newly reinvigorated petrochemical industry um, has really started to also try to work for permitting also. And so they are frustrated, very understandably. So they've come to the clinic um, to say, you know, these industries are not going anywhere. We're really facing a huge challenge. And so what we would like to do instead is think about a more holistic a more holistic solution, you know, we're really inspired by the prison abolition movement. So can we try to think about ways to plug into movements, right, especially eco-socialism, to better kind of get a grasp of regional international activism and opportunities for synergy? so that we can really engage in radical transformation instead of just kind of sticking to traditional law reform efforts through traditional environmental law, right? So this is the movement lawyering, you know, community-oriented lawyering problem that they have brought to the clinic sort of in early stages as they kind of think about, you know, what's out there and what are real systemic change models that we can think through that are tied to eco-socialism. So that's All right. Well, well, thank you so much, uh, Priya, for uh, framing our hypothetical and, and kicking things off for, for my piece of the presentation. Um, so yeah, so I'll now do a critical legal research application in the specific context of this group, uh, the Central uh, Appalachian Advocates. And in terms of how I'm going to proceed, first thing I want to run through some critical legal research, what we call deconstructive strategies, or demonstrating how legal research um, platforms favor the status quo. Here, traditional forms of environmental law, such as these permitting regimes uh, and incremental environmental law reform in the form of this environmental litigation that the Central Appalachian Advocates are really trying to transcend uh, moving forward. 
And then second, I'm gonna be looking at some critical legal research what we call reconstructive strategies or demonstrating how alternative research resources beyond Westlaw, Lexis, Bloomberg Law, et cetera, uh, can inform this eco-socialist research project that uh, the clinic uh, is doing on behalf of this group, again, the Central Appalachian uh, Advocates. So here we just have some more specific strategies in the context of, again, both deconstructing uh, and reconstructing uh, the legal research regime. And essentially, I'll just sort of run through these uh, strategies and unpack them in a very general sense. And then we're going to concretely uh, apply some of these strategies to research on uh, Western Lexus and then beyond uh, in the context of our research prompt. So first, starting with deconstructing legal research, again, revealing how this regime or West and Lexus and Bloomberg Law, et cetera, uh, insidiously favors the societal status quo. There are many ways uh, through which we can deconstruct the legal research regime very well established now in the literature. Uh, so these are just a few sample methods or sites uh, through which we can uh, deconstruct the regime. So first we have search algorithms. And this is basically just what you're using every time you're conducting your keyword searches on uh, Westlaw and Lexis. And the major takeaway point here is that the West and Lexis search algorithms do have relevancy dictates, and that these relevancy dictates do favor popular uh, and ideologically middle of the road content by design. And correspondingly, they're designed to disfavor radical and transgressive content like the eco-socialist content uh, that we're exploring here in the context of our uh, research prompt. Of course, uh, AI has uh, similar biases built into it, something that um, Nicholas is gonna be talking about uh, more uh, here shortly, both in terms of the extractive AI that's already on West and Lexus and the, and the generative AI to come. So then we also have, uh, in terms of deconstructing the legal research regime, the fact that these databases generally exclude radical content. Uh, and this is to say that these legal databases, again, West and Lexis, are devoid, generally speaking, of interdisciplinary scholarship in terms of sociology or radical history content or gender studies content. Also, that there's not substantial left foreign law content or left legal adjacent content. Generally speaking, uh, on Western Lexus, again, these databases are designed more for uh, for corporate uh, attorneys operating in the global north. Um, and then in terms of the U.S. legal scholarship that is in Western Lexus, in terms of those law review databases that we all use, the point here is that U.S. legal scholarship uh, often lacks a radical nexus. Now, for sure, I know that clinical scholarship is a counter example to this general trend. Uh, Priya and I have worked together for a long time. Um, I often rely on progressive and radical clinical scholarship in my work. I'm just talking about general trends in US legal scholarship. The US Law Academy is not known as a particularly radical place, as we all know, and, and often uh, US legal scholarship reflects more of the law and economics uh, tradition uh, and so forth. Okay, so let's look at some concrete examples of how our legal databases exhibit biases, again, in the context of our central Appalachian advocates research prompt, starting with search algorithms. So here, as a concrete example, I have used the Westlaw database. You can see that I've conducted a search across all law reviews and journals on Westlaw. And I have searched for uh, environmental law uh, as an exact phrase, uh, which is generally a broad search. Um, and so unsurprisingly, you'll see that we do have 10,000 plus results uh, listed on this uh, listed on this screen. And the major takeaway point here is just that these results are going to be arranged by relevance. Uh, and that this relevance is um, encoded within the Westlaw search algorithm to generously to generally favor uh, the societal status quo. And so in the context of our research prompt, it's not particularly surprising that the top law review articles that we're seeing here do reflect ideologically middle of the road content or popular type content. And that given a broad general search like environmental law, we're not seeing radical law review articles pushed to the top of our results screen, such as 
articles on uh, eco-socialism in the environmental law context. Instead, the relevancy dictates are pushing eco-socialist type law review articles to the extent that they exist in Westlaw and Lexis way down, uh, again, based on those relevancy dictates. So our first point is that we do have uh, an insidious bias within these search algorithms that does tend to push down or disfavor radical content. But the second point in terms of deconstructing uh, the legal research regime today is that there also is a general exclusion of radical content in uh, Westlaw and Lexis. And this certainly um, is true in the case of radical eco-socialist content in terms of US legal scholarship. So now let's see just how much eco-socialist type uh, content there is on Westlaw and Lexis. It's us. So again, oh, go ahead, Priya. It is, it's us. We are the- It's us, yeah. yes. yes. <laughs> so again, I conducted a search on Westlaw. Uh, and again, I searched across all law reviews and journals on Westlaw. And I did a very broad search for either eco-socialism or the most common variant of eco-socialism, which, which just has a hyphen. So basically this is pulling up any law review article period that simply mentions eco-socialism. And so rather than 10,000 plus law review articles, uh, we're seeing only 24 uh, across all of the tens of thousands of law review articles that are available on Westlaw, just 24 results. And as Priya just pointed out, I didn't know this in, in putting the talk together, but the top result is us. Uh, it's an article involving uh, a conversation between Priya and I on eco-socialism. Uh, and then the second top result is an article of mine, uh, another article on eco-socialism. And I went ahead and looked through the rest of the 24 results because I was curious at that point. In fact, like a third of these 24 articles on eco-socialism are either Priya's articles or my articles. So in short, uh, there are um, not very many articles at all uh, that have been written on uh, eco-socialism. Um, and so we're not seeing very many results at all. And so practically speaking, this means that when we're conducting our research here on behalf of the Central Appalachian Advocates, there's simply not gonna be very much uh, available in Westlaw and Lexus to help us with the research project. Um, sure, these RV articles uh, can get us started, but uh, we're gonna have to look elsewhere uh, to find more comprehensive content. So that then brings us to our second critical legal research reconstructive strategy which is to demonstrate how alternative research resources beyond Westlaw and Lexis and Bloomberg Law, et cetera, uh, can inform the specific uh, research prompt. So turning to those uh, reconstructive research strategies, um, there are many reconstructive research strategies. Obviously, we don't have time today to do concrete examples uh, of, of using all of these reconstructive strategies. Um, I'll just briefly introduce them, and then we'll do just one concrete uh, example um, as we're more moving towards the end of my talk. So some basic reconstructive research strategies include a more targeted use of commercial and non-commercial legal databases, specific methods to locate marginalized and radical legal scholarship, methods to locate interdisciplinary scholarship, left foreign law and left legal adjacent content, locating narrative works, which as we all know is so important vis-a-vis um, -vis schools such as critical race theory, and then adopting specific grassroots and democratized approaches to legal research, uh, such as embedding legal research in uh, community lawyering modes. And there's just an excellent chapter in the textbook, Critical Justice, Systemic Advocacy in Law and Society on how to engage in some, such bottom-up uh, grassroots research approaches. But again, limited time today, so we'll just do one concrete example of one of these reconstructive research strategies, which is relying on interdisciplinary scholarship that's simply uh, not available on Westlaw and Lexis. So here, as a concrete example, in the context of our research prompt, I'm using the EBSCOhost database, uh, which is a very large interdisciplinary database that has articles in the social sciences uh, and the humanities and so on. And so again, uh, I've conducted the exact same search for either eco-socialism or the most common variant of eco-socialism with a hyphen. And look what we see. We see not 24 total results, of which a third are either uh, Priyas or mine, but we're seeing nearly 800 results or interdisciplinary uh, scholarly works in terms of articles uh, and ebooks and so forth that cover um, 
eco-socialism. So we have much more material to work with in engaging in this research on behalf of the uh, central Appalachian advocates. And let me conclude uh, by just showing you some of the results of this research and how that research can specifically help um, our, our client here, the central Appalachian advocates. So this is an example of uh, an interdisciplinary article. Uh, it's from the journal uh, Capitalism, Nature, Socialism. As you might imagine, that's not the sort of journal that we tend to see in Westlaw and Lexis. And this interdisciplinary article is helpful because it provides a basic overview of eco-socialism at the 10,000 foot view. It's an entry point. It's a way to wrap our arms around what eco-socialism is. Just a short snippet. There's many definitions of eco-socialism, but this article says that we can identify three broad principles, the priority of use value over exchange value in the market, collective ownership of the means of production and democratic economic planning to shape and constrain markets and contraction and convergence and consumption levels between the global north and the global south. So a 10,000 foot view of what eco-socialism is, a way to get us started, doesn't necessarily help us resolve the concrete question from the central Appalachian advocates. But if we do more interdisciplinary research, we'll get concrete answers, potential paths forward for the central Appalachian advocates. One example is an ebook that you can find in interdisciplinary databases by an author and scholar named Max Isle. It's called A People's Green New Deal. This book is not about a liberal or Keynesian uh, Green New Deal, the sort that we can um, associate with the congressional proposal uh, that came out about five years ago. This is very much a post-capitalist, radical, eco-socialist Green New Deal, exactly what the Central Appalachian adv advocates are interested in. So this is an example of a specific work that our group, the Central Appalachian Advocates, can pursue as an eco-socialist Green New Deal seeks to do exactly what they want. It seeks to eliminate the fossil fuel industry entirely and pursue a radical just transition for rural areas and subordinated communities as part of post-capitalist transformations coordinated from local to global scales. Much of this book uh, is about the global south, but the book actually uses Appalachian coal communities as one um, case model or one small example that it discusses of an important global north community that is already fighting for an eco-socialist uh, uh, future. So that's the sort of movement that our, um, our group, the Central Appalachian Advocates, can plug themselves into um, moving forward. So that is all I have. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks so much for that, Nick. So quickly to before we transition, what I think is an important takeaway here is it's hard enough getting our students to not Google, right? So like getting them to the commercial search engine is sometimes a win. But within the commercial search engine, there are all of these ways in which they're not going to actually find the answers that the clients need them to find. And if we don't introduce them to that as a limitation, they're going to come back during supervision and say, sorry, professor, I didn't find anything, right? Without even understanding why their results are non-existent or thin, and or even understanding then after that where they go. Um, and so this problem is, of course, only going to get more complicated, right? Which is what um, Nicholas Mignanelli is going to now talk to us about, the, the ghost of Christmas future. That's a scary thought. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks so much for having me. And I'm just going to give sort of a critical perspective about sort of some of the conversations about uh, AI driven legal research and law practice technologies. And, you know, AI is a loaded term. There's questions about whether it's an appropriate label for the technologies that have been emerging in the last year or so. Uh, but in a broad sense, uh, you have been using AI for more than a decade now. Uh, machine learning, one variant of AI, is what allows you to use natural language searching in a database. It's why you might feel that uh, the search results in that database have improved over time. But what I really want to talk to you all about uh, today is generative AI and its use in legal research and law practice technology, so-called AI-driven legal research. And formerly, I used the term AI-powered legal research uh, in my writing. And I, I regret it now because I actually think AI driven does a better job of capturing what's at stake in terms of who and what you are putting in the driver's seat with these technologies. So, you know, a lot of different uh, language has been used to talk about large language models, uh, stochastic uh, parrots, uh, modern day alchemy, 
um, a giant uh, autocomplete system, computational statistics. But at the core of this technology is the algorithm. And as the mathematician Kathy O'Neill has written, an algorithm is just an opinion written in math. So last year, many were taken with the release of ChatGPT and captivated by uh, what this chatbot can do, how quickly it improves in sort of terms of its different versions. And the AI hype soon seeped once again, as it had several years ago, into the legal community. Um, legal tech startups began to run with this technology, making just incredible claims like this one uh, by Jake Heller, co-founder of Case Text. Uh, Mr. Heller says, um, this creates a momentous opportunity for attorneys to delegate tasks like legal research to an AI, freeing them to focus on the more, the most impactful aspects of their practice. Uh, it's not clear to me what those most impactful aspects of law practice are, as I'll explain in a few minutes. Shortly thereafter, Case Text was acquired by Thomson Reuters, parent company of Westlaw, for a whopping $650 million. We still don't know how it will be incorporated into that platform, but it will be quite soon. And Lexis is working on its own LLM-based features. Uh, those of us uh, in critical law librarianship were not so shocked by all of these events. We had been uh, anticipating this technology for several years. This is a quote from an article I wrote uh, in early 2019 and was very influenced by these conversations sort of talking about the idea that complex briefs will be created from previously uploaded material. This is sort of the direction we sort of suspected things were going in. So, you know, what's so bad about AI-driven legal research? Is it the hallucinations? Uh, you'll all recall this story from the headlines. My favorite part is that this attorney actually asked ChatGPT if it had made up the cases and ChatGPT said no. Uh, hallucinations are a problem, and to be sure, they are here to stay. They are a feature, not an aberration of large language models. That's important to remember. Uh, Chatbots are not attempting to identify the information you're searching for, uh, but rather they're simply telling you what, it, what, what they have calculated you want to hear. Now, hallucinations can be mitigated with a more refined data set. But the bold claim I want to make is that Doing legal research using an LLM-based chatbot solely or primarily would be problematic, even if the cases were real. And this is, this is, I would say, for two reasons. First, it conceals the research process. And second, it entrenches the biases of the dominant interest in our society. And I'll talk about what I mean by that. So AI-driven legal research conceals the legal research process itself. Here, the concern is not job security for law librarians, but something far more complex, namely legal indeterminacy. AI-driven legal research has a tendency to make the researcher believe that law is far more determinate than it really is. It masks contingencies. Now, all legal research tools, even the oldest ones, partially conceal information, omitting materials that the creator uh, thinks irrelevant. So just consider the index, for instance, which is about as old as you can get. The index uh, directs the researcher to only that information that the indexer believes essential to each entry. And using an index, the researcher gives up the ability to freely peruse the entire body of legal information without curation, instead deferring to the choices of the indexer for the sake of efficiency. Uh, so the researcher sees the law through the eyes of the indexer, but the researcher is cognizant of the human judgment inherent in indexing. AI-driven legal research, on the other hand, tends to give the researcher the false impression that she is being presented with an objectively right, an objectively correct answer, devoid of human involvement, devoid of human judgment, sort of a neutral answer. But as Susan Neville Mart has written, uh, every database has a point of view. And I think we can update this now and say every chatbot will have a point of view, has a point of view. Uh, in a 2017 article, Mart compared the top 10 results of 50 searches across six legal databases. She found that the results differed dramatically from database to database, demonstrating that what a researcher finds in the process of searching depends heavily on who builds the search algorithms and what choices they make in the process. Thus, the, the biases and the assumptions of programmers, for instance, are imputed to the search algorithms that they write. 
And this leads me to my next point, which is AI-driven legal research tools entrench the biases of society's dominant interests. Uh, and but how in sort of three different ways. So first, let's start with the programmers. The programmers write the rules. Now, of course, machine learning algorithms, once they're launched, are not even knowable by their creators after that point. But programmers who write the rules hail from homogenous backgrounds. They're from homogenous groups. Uh, they are they have particular incentives, typically pro corporate profit. Uh, they're disproportionately white, disproportionately male, disproportionately upper class, educated typically at elite institutions. And then we have the data set, sort of the other element in this system. Um, the data set in the case of LLM-based legal research and law practice tools is uh, the corpus of Anglo-American law. And when you automate that corpus, you are automating along with it the systemic biases and hidden assumptions embedded within it. And finally, users reinforce algorithms with their behavior. And the primary and most certainly the earliest users of commercial legal research tools are those who can afford to use them. So think big law attorneys, the white shoe law firms, government attorneys. Now, feminist and critical race scholars have been calling attention to the dangers inherent in the biases found in AI systems for some time now. But when legal tech vendors are confronted with these concerns, their response is typically that they will address these biases in an unspecified way at an unspecified time. And the truth is they don't have a plan because they know that this the bias is baked into the cake. By way of analogy, I thought I'd talk about this recent study in which researchers asked AI to create images of Black doctors treating white patients. AI refused. Whatever prompt researchers used, they could not generate Black doctors and white patients in one image. And this is because, as Kareem Carr has pointed out, AI doesn't reason, it uses statistics. And so uh, it is not able to generate a scenario that occurs with low probability in its training data set. Now, this will happen, sort of a version of this, an equivalent uh, scenario will happen in AI-driven legal research, no different than in AI-generated art. The only question is whether we'll be able to recognize it when it does. So, you know, I've identified what I see as the problems, and so I wanna talk about what I see as sort of paths toward disruption here. So, you know, first I would say algorithm, algorithmic activism, which means first and foremost, teaching our students to be critical consumers of legal information and to be algorithmic skeptics. Also demanding of vendors and regulators, almost more importantly, transparency, auditing, challengeability of these systems. Uh, it would also be good, good to know how these systems use our data, the data that we're inputting, our clients' data. I highly recommend Sarah Lambden's book, Data Cartels, the companies that control and monopolize our information. I assigned it to my research students in the spring, uh, and I think they found it uh, really eye-opening. Another technique would be transgressive in archaeological bibliography. And here I put a photo of one of my idols, Morris Cohen, who looks like the stereotype of a legal bibliographer. But legal bibliography is actually very radical. It is a means of accessing law's fossil record to understand the genealogies of the law and uh, it forces and the forces that have shaped it. Uh, we must dig deep uh, and teach our students to dig deep to find outliers to find silenced voices, to find alternative explanations for the way things are. Uh, we have to teach our students to cast a wide net for information and to sort of reconstruct information chronologically so that they can fathom the social constructedness of legal information and escape what Carl Llewellyn called the threat of the available, sort of just going with what's in front of us. And fi finally, uh, we must find ways to formalize unplugged brainstorming. And Tia sort of uh, uh, touched on this. Uh, stepping away from the platform to recenter the client and their community and to do so as a collective of lawyers working for law reform. So sort of not, not allowing ourselves to be driven by these systems, but sort of taking control back and giving control to our clients and their communities. And above all, I think... 
we must never lose sight of the fact that legal research is not something to be delegated to an AI, as Jake Heller urges, um, but rather legal research is the creative process. And here I think of uh, a quote by Zora Neale Hurston, my favorite author, research is formalized curiosity, is poking and prying with a purpose. It is a seeking that he who wishes may know the cosmic secrets of the world and they that dwell therein. So sort of uh, really, we need to teach our students to conceptualize, to own their legal research, not to backload it, not to outsource it, uh, and to use it as a legal creative, uh, as sort of a legal creative process, which allows for legal innovation and law reform. Thank you so much for that, Nicholas. Um, so again, like kind of bringing it back to the clinical context, I think one of the important things we need to grapple with as clinicians is we talk about, you know, client-centered lawyering all of the time. We talk about the importance of teaching those skills and really like legal research has a very critical thinking and client-centered lawyering nexus. And so if we don't explicitly kind of address that, it, you know, we are losing an opportunity to really kind of approach lawyering from a holistic manner. And then the other part of it is, you know, um, th this idea that like all, a lot of students, if you tell them, well, why shouldn't you use chat GPT as part of your research? They'll be like, oh, well, you know, there's ethics issues. So the, the first thing I asked during my first supervision meeting this semester was, okay, so how do we start our research process? How are we going to answer this question? And one of my students actually said, I'm going to type it into chat GPT. And upon seeing a look on my face said, oh, well, don't worry, professor, I'm going to strip it of all of the you know, confidential information. And so just that like automatic disconnect of that, that is not the only problem. <laughs> you know, the ethics quandary is not the only problem. It's, it's that you're removing the thinking and what that cost is to our client, who's actually trying to do something pretty radical and revolutionary. There's no connection if we don't figure out a way to bridge that, whether it's through our legal research classes or thinking about incorporating modules or working with law librarians and research faculty in our Network, you know, so the whole point of this session is to kind of introduce the topic and to hopefully foment discussion and future collaboration. So I'm going to stop there in our last kind of seven minutes um, to see if anyone has any questions from the audience. It's great to see so many familiar um, names and and stock photos. So I'm not sure if I turn it over to you, Allison, at this point. For Sure. I was just going to encourage folks to use the chat function or unmute themselves and throw out a question if they have one in our last few minutes. I will say also that we have a bibliography um, that the presenters have put together that Leah will be circulating uh, and through email. And then I think we can post it on the website when the video yeah. is uploaded. Okay, exactly. exactly. And yeah. part, of the, part of the bibliography includes like a helpful um, research guide that um, Americans Library has put together that has like sample exercises um, in addition to a more detailed, um, detailed readings um, for folks who are interested in starting the journey. Awesome. Thank you so much for putting that together. We will um, we will certainly circulate that as well as have it posted on the CLIA website when the session is up uh, after our recording is concluded. Um, but thank you so much to our presenters. Um, this is, and, and what a point in the semester to have this, uh, have all of this information sort of at our fingertips. Um, you know, as for clinicians, especially, this is the time when we rely on our muscle memory and we're actually always reacting and so to slow it down, to think more deliberately about how we can introduce our students to these concepts and better serve our clients is really extraordinary, um, both now and I know in the semesters and weeks to come. So thank you so much to our amazing presenters today. Thank you to all of you for joining us uh, for this first session of our uh, school year. Um, again, as Layla mentioned, our next presentation will be on November 8th with Lee Goodmark. We encourage you to go ahead and register and then take a look at our amazing lineup for uh, the, the spring semester as well. Um, thanks so much to all of you. Have a wonderful rest of your week and uh, see you next time.